like to give a very warm welcome to our service this morning, whether you're here with us in person or whether you're joining with us online. Last week was our Spring Bible Conference, and uh, just a reminder, but if you missed any of those services and you'd like to catch up on them, uh, they'll be on YouTube from this week. Uh, the first one will be actually playing now, uh, as this uh, service even happens as well too. So all those are going to be available on YouTube this coming week. So if you missed any of the nights, you can catch up on them there. But as we thought of this uh, wonderful doctrine of the, the Trinity and how this related to our understanding of the gospel and the church, I thought it would be appropriate today to begin uh, with this little passage from Colossians 1, verse 15. And it says, He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile him to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. You know, Jesus is the one who here reveals God, the one who through him all things, it says, were made. And he's the one who is before all things. And how wonderful that we have a God who wants to reveal himself to us, who wants us to, to know him. And how even more wonderful uh, that he gave the Son of God himself in order that we may be reconciled and that we may even one day enter into his, his presence as well too. What a great wonder that is. And that's something that, that truly is worth singing about this morning, isn't it? And we're going to do that as we begin our service with this uh, beautiful hymn, Jesus is King and I will extol him. And we'll stand as we sing this together, please. <laughs> Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks, Lord, that you have revealed yourself to us. Through creation, Lord, even we can see of your goodness, your faithfulness, and your majesty. 
And Father, through your word, how that even reveals more of your character, of your dealings with men, and Father, also of your will. And Father, how it reveals of your Son as well. Father, you revealed yourself through your Son, even enabling us to see more of, of who you are. And Father, giving us the means even to approach you even through his sacrifice. Lord, we want to thank you that Jesus is our King. He is the one who is our priest as well. He intercedes for us. And Father, that your fullness even dwelt within him. And that through his sacrifice, sinners can be reconciled to you. Lord, we do want to give you thanks even for the Spring Bible Conference that has, t- has gone past now. And we want to give you thanks for even for what we've learned of the, the glorious Trinity. And how this relates even to, to our identity as believers. For the implications even for how it relates to the gospel. And how it even applies to the church as well too. We do want to give you thanks, Lord, that you reveal yourself in such a way. And how wonderful it is that we have you as the, the Father. How you've revealed yourself in the Son. And Father, how you, you dwell within us even by your Spirit. Lord, we do want to give you thanks for, for Gordon's ministry, even in the previous week. Lord, we ask that you would bless him and his ministry there and carried off. And we do pray for our brothers and sisters there, even today as they meet. And Lord, we ask that you would help them, Lord. We ask that you would bless them as they do seek to reach out into their own respective areas as well. And Father, we do pray for the, the sister churches as well, even in our association as well. And even as we come up to these assembly meetings as well. Lord, as different believers will gather together, just help us to wonder even at the, and be amazed and to give thanks for the great fellowship that we have together. That we can serve you, Lord, in each and our respective areas. And Lord, be glorified through us and for association. We do pray for Dave Ramsey, even as he heads up the work of the association. And even in the busyness of all these assembly meetings coming up, Lord, just give him the, the strength that he needs, the, the wisdom even that he needs as well. And we pray for all who are involved in that. And Lord, we do ask for your help also even for ourselves today, even as we proclaim your word, as we sing all of these hymns. And Father, as we give glory to you, Lord, we ask that the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. And so we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me begin with some announcements uh, today. Um, so tonight's service at 6.30 will be taking the service uh, there, and then there'll be a time of prayer. Don't forget at the, the room at the back, uh, starting at 6 o'clock. And then on Tuesday night, our midweeks resume as usual at 8 o'clock. And then uh, next week is our assembly meetings so uh, you'll maybe have seen it from some of the notices in the PowerPoint or you're coming in of some of these meetings. Um, but just uh, keep these in your, your prayers. There's the Church's Council on Saturday morning. And then also there's a Baptist Women's event that's actually running uh, this Friday for the Baptist Women's event. There's a little bit of a change to some of the, uh, the usual events. I know in the past it's been in Lisburn Baptist. But this year that's different. It's actually held in a number of different places. So and as you sit there before the service, have a look at some of those places where it's taken place. Um, so as I say, the location for each of these meetings is different. So the Baptist Women's Night is this Friday, um, and it's at Windsor Baptist at 7.30. And the speaker is Christine Mahood. Now, Christine's a teacher at Andrew's Memorial. Uh, she was the, the teacher who invited us in, actually, to take the SU. And she's uh, speaking, and I think it's Psalm 46, and the Baptist Women's Night. Um, now, what you can do is you can also get that event if you aren't able to go to um, at Windsor Baptist on that evening. You can actually get it online. However, you do need to register for it. You need to register for it, and they will send you the link uh, so you can access that. So, you can, so ladies, you can actually tune in to the, the Baptist Women's Event in the comfort even of your own home, if, if you wish, as well, too. Uh, but we'll maybe say more about that even on Tuesday evening as well. Now, the Missions Night, which is running not this Tuesday, but next week, um, on that night, there's not going to be a midweek because we're going to try and maybe encourage the folks to, to actually to go to the actual Missions Night. And that will be taking place at Balna Hinch Baptist. You'll hear more about those, uh, that assembly meeting next week. So we'll announce more about the Baptist Missions Night. So 
don't get those mixed up. This Tuesday, we're here. Next Tuesday, it's the Baptist Missions Night. Okay, But with it being Assembly Week, next Sunday is going to be Assembly Sunday. So we're going to have Jonathan Burke from Donica D. Baptist, who's preaching here. <coughs> Meanwhile, I'm going to be taking Jonathan's services in Donica D. So there's a little bit of a pulpit swap going on, as a number of the church, Baptist churches do, uh, in Assembly Sunday. So I'll be in Donica D. And Jonathan, uh, God willing, will be here. So please do pray for him. Um, and also just regarding we've been having a number of announcements regarding the Ukraine situation and we took a collection for that as well we do want to thank you so much for your generosity for the Ukraine project we had given a donation of £400 to the, the Fast Romania project um, that was one that we briefed you on already um, we also gave a further donation of 890 to Slavic Gospel Association so Slavic Gospel Association and they're involved in a whole series of projects actually through Ukraine and through different areas actually that are impacted um, by this and, and if you want to actually see uh, updates as to what even it's, they're, they're doing there they do actually post up regular updates each week so the website is and this is testing my memory now sga.org.uk and if you go on to there, that's sga.org.uk, if you go on to there, there's a little tab for Ukraine at the top. And you can click latest news about Ukraine. And what you'll see is every week they post about three or four updates as they actually some of the work that they're involved in there. So Fast Romania we've supported and also the work of Slavic Gospel Association who are seeking to provide aid but also support for the churches there. Now they sent us a, a letter which I want to read to you. So they've said, It is with deep appreciation that I want to thank you for sending this kind gift to the work and ministry of SGA UK. It has been incredibly moving that so many are standing with us during these difficult days and supporting the many and varied projects in which we're involved. Obviously, one of these projects is the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. At our recent prayer meeting, Pastor Igor Bandura informed us that many of these pastors and missionaries whom SGA supports on the east of Ukraine have had to leave the area in order to protect their families. Already there's a second influx of refugees fleeing, fleeing from the east to the west as troops amass in the Donbass region. 22 Baptist churches there have been destroyed or damaged. And yet, he testifies, the believers in Ukraine continue to experience God's blessings on his church and the work is expanding. So that's encouraging to know the work is expanding even in the midst of these great times of trial. He urged us to keep on praying. The battle is still going on, he says, and the day of victory is still waiting, but God is faithful. And they say, thank you again for this practical demonstration of your love and concern. We thank you for your prayers. We trust that God would continue to bless and use us as good stewards in his service. And that's sent from Sharon Hard, the SGA office administrator at Slavic Gospel Association. We do want to give you thanks for your generosity even towards that project. And it's important for us to keep praying for the believers in Ukraine and those who even leave in the area. And there's, there's others even in nearby regions who are welcoming them in and trying to support them as well. And the work of SG is even ministering in those areas as well too, as indeed is Fast Romania seeking to give them even that place to stay. So... Um, it is important for us to keep praying for our brothers and sisters around the world and those in great need today. But our next chorus we're going to sing reminds us that we are an army of ordinary people, but part of a kingdom where love is the key, a people whose life is in Jesus. And just stay seated as we sing this, please.
Well, today I want to return to our series on the book of Nehemiah. Uh, we didn't get to finish this little series before Easter, but I want to come back to it today. I'm returning to Nehemiah 11. So there's just another few messages to go before we finish this off. So I know it's going to be interrupted a little bit next week because of Assembly Sunday, but I do want to draw it to the end of this series. It's, so it's been about three weeks, uh, or maybe even more, since we were last in this book. So let me refresh our memory as to what has happened in the book. So after the exiles had returned to the city of Jerusalem, the work of rebuilding the city had ground to a halt. The temple had been rebuilt, but the walls of the city had been in disrepair. And so enters Nehemiah. Uh, This is where the book of Nehemiah comes in. So God providentially had Nehemiah in a position. He was the king's cupbearer. He'd given him that access to the king and enabled him to gain favor in the king's eyes. And the Lord had really put Nehemiah in this position and given him this burden. And he was able to return with the king's approval and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, with obviously not on his own, with the help of the others there in Jerusalem. But they faced, as we know, a lot of opposition because not everyone was happy to see the city being rebuilt or even Nehemiah arriving. But then what we saw that these walls were only a part of the problem. In many ways, the state of these walls served to only illustrate the state of the heart of the people. Because many of the people's hearts had grown cold towards God. Many had grown lax about keeping his commands. And so Ezra the scribe had read the word of God to them. So the situation we were at was they rebuilt the walls. But then in Nehemiah um, 7, we see how um, the... Uh, sorry, Nehemiah 8, I think it was, sorry, of how Ezra had begun to read the word of the law to them and how that law had convicted their hearts. The people were repenting of their sin. And where we left off a few weeks ago was that the people, uh, they weren't just weeping and repenting over their sin, but they also made a covenant with God. And that's where we finished. They'd made a covenant with God to obey and that impacted various areas of their lives, their married life, their, their business life as well, where they were promising to keep the Sabbath. And there were a number of Gentiles were coming in and trying to trade with them on the, on the Sabbath day. So they repented of that and, and they were, were seeking to, to obey God's law in, in, the, in the way that they should. They were seeking to honor the Lord in, in all parts of their life. So their home life, their business life, but also their worship too. Their worship hadn't even been what it was. They weren't keeping some of the feasts even as they had ought to. So they were seeking to restore that. So it finished on an encouraging note. And how would they continue? That's the question. And let's see. We come to chapter 11 where there's a whole series of names again. This isn't the first time in the book of Nehemiah where we see a series of names. But this is an important section to cover. And we're going to just read actually the first nine verses just of this. Rather than uh, listening to to me pronounce all the names in chapter 11 and in chapter 12, uh, there's actually two chapters of names. We are going to come back to uh, chapter 12, God willing, after the assembly Sunday. Uh, The latter part of that chapter we're going to come to. But we're just going to read the first nine verses of chapter 11. And I will be referring to these verses, the rest of them. So do keep your Bibles open as well. Because it is important not only in the history of the children of Israel... But also it's actually relevant for us too as well. Because God was going to do a mighty work through these people. So let's see what, how, what happened next. Nehemiah 11 verse 1. Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem. And the rest of the people cast lots to bring out one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city. While nine out of ten remained in the other towns. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. These are the chiefs of the province who lived in Jerusalem. But in the towns of Judah, everyone lived on his own on his property in their towns. Israel, the priests, the Levites, the temple servants, and the descendants of Solomon's servants. And in Jerusalem lived certain of the sons of Judah and of the sons of Benjamin, of the sons of Judah, Athiah, the sons of Uzziah, the son of Zechariah, the son of Amariah, the son of Shephtiah, the son of Mahalil, the, sons of, the son of Perez, Messiah, the son of Barak, son of Colhezah, son of Haziah, the son of Adiah, the son of Joriab, the son of Zechariah, son of the Shilonite, 
All the sons of Perez who lived in Jerusalem were 468 valiant men. And these are the sons of Benjamin, Salu, the son of Meshalem, the son of Joed, the son of Padiah, the son of Coliah, the son of Messiah, the son of Athiel, the son of Jesiah, and his brothers, men of valor, 928. Joel, the son of Zikri, was their overseer. And Judah, the son of Hassaniah, was second over the city. And we'll end our reading there. Here were a group of people, a people, though, that were bound together. And we're going to sing. We are also bound together as well as believers. And we're going to sing about that which unites us. We are part of the body of Christ. What binds us together is we have that one faith, that one Lord. And that's what our next hymn reminds us of. Blessed be the tie that binds. And we'll stand as we sing this together, please. some of the needs of our church in prayer uh, I'm trying to hold back a little bit in my singing voice today because uh, I'm trying to save my voice actually for preaching um, the voice still isn't 100% yet but it's getting there uh, maybe drinking a few more uh, glasses of water there this morning but um, just pray for a number of different folks um, it's great to see Nan out with us today I uh, just give thanks even for uh, for Nan and Nan's recovery but also continue to pray for her I know she's still not feeling just 100% yet as well too. So continue to pray for her. Continue to pray for Willie as well. And also continue to pray for Norman, as we mentioned um, during, the, during the week. Uh, Norman's out of hospital. But uh, continue to pray for him as he receives further treatment. And he is still quite weak at this uh, time as well. And do, do pray for, for Hazel. But pray for him that the Lord will continue to strengthen him. And uh, also pray for Terry. Um, Terry was having surgery in his hand yesterday. So do pray for him as well today, just even as he recovers from, from that surgery at the moment. But a number of different prayer needs, and we're going to come before the Lord and ask for his help and blessing as well, even as we come to God's word. Let's pray together. 
Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you, Lord, for what binds us together, for the fellowship that we have, for the access even that we have to you, our Heavenly Father, through faith in Christ, because of even the grace in which we stand. And Father, we do want to give you thanks that we can come before you to, to worship. And Lord, if, as this hymn has reminds us of, that we can bring before you even our, the burdens of our hearts. And we want to give you thanks of the glorious hope even that we have. And how as the hymn has reminded us that one day the, the fullness of this glorious hope will be realized. But Father, you do give us hope even in this, this present world. And Father, we do pray just for the needs of our assembly. Lord, we want to give thanks for answered prayer in the week that's gone past, for Norman getting out of hospital. And we do continue to pray for him as he continues to receive treatment and as he is all cares for him at home. Lord, strengthen him. Lord, we ask that you will undertake for him. And we want to give thanks for Nan also being out of hospital as well. But Lord, in part, even the strength that she needs as well as she cares for Willie at home as well too. And Lord, help him. Lord, as, even as he watches the service online as well too, may that be a, a help even to him. And Father, we do pray also for Terry, even as he recovers from this recent surgery. Lord, bring healing, Lord, even to his hand. And just, Lord, give him that just measure of health and strength again, Lord. And we do want to give you thanks, Lord, even that, that even that appointment was able to come through, that he was able to receive this surgery that he's been waiting for so long. And Lord, we do pray for, for others as well, for Sadie Brain, Lord, continue to help her, and for, for Audrey, and to, just for, for many others, Lord, even the need of a touch from yourself. Lord, we pray for John and Gwyneth as well, Lord, continue to help them, and Lord, for others too. Lord, we ask even for help for ourselves. Lord, maybe even there's others here with just burdens even that other people don't even know about. But Lord, you know all things. And so, Lord, even of these of these even unuttered prayer requests, Lord, you know of them. And Lord, you hear them. And Lord, you can answer them. So Lord, even through your word today, we ask that you would encourage us, that you would challenge us. And Lord, you would speak through it and help us. And Lord, how we need the help of your Holy Spirit as we come to this word. Lord, be glorified through it. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Let's turn to Nehemiah 11 once more, please. <coughs> Nehemiah 11. So once more, we come to a passage in the book of Nehemiah. And we did, last year we did Ezra. And we see in Ezra and Nehemiah, there's several lists. Actually, in the book of Nehemiah alone, um, there's, there's five lists really in total. In chapter 3, there was a list of all those who rebuilt the wall and the sections that they built. And then in chapter 7, there was a genealogy of those who returned in the exile. And then even as we came to the passage where the, the people made that covenant before God, there was a list of all those who, who signed the covenant. And Well, not of, of all who signed the covenant, but really the families represented. And now in chapter, chapters 11 and 12, there's two further lists. And as I mentioned before, if you've ever uh, used one of those read the Bible in the year uh, schemes, you sometimes come across passages like this and Maybe sometimes you, you face a temptation to maybe skip them to get to the, the, the action, if you like. But they do have something like this to, to say. These passages do have something to say to us. They're in God's word for a reason. Uh, maybe they're, they might not be filled with action or drama. But behind these names, there is a story to tell. And these passages are in about our Bibles for a reason. So while maybe m many of the names are unfamiliar to us, they matter enough to be included in Scripture. So what lessons can we learn from this passage? The first thing I want us to see is about the need. There was a great need. Uh, there was a situation the people faced. And we see of this need in verses 1 to 2. Really, there's just two headings, really, uh, in today's message. Really, there's the need is the first thing we're going to come to. And the next thing we're going to come, come to from verse 3 onwards is really the people and their priority. So there's the need and the people and their priority. So let's look at the need, first of all, in verses 1 to 2. I want to spend a bit of time on these uh, first two verses because the people faced actually a really difficult situation because while the people had rebuilt the city walls and while they'd recommitted themselves to obeying God, the problem was that Jerusalem was still relatively empty. 
And if you uh, flick back a few chapters to chapter 7, verse 4, what you'll see, chapter 7, this was just before the reading of the law of God and the recommitment of the people. And in chapter 7, verse 4, what you see is the city was wide and large, but the people within it were few. No houses had been built. So they were in this situation where they had the temple built, they had the walls now rebuilt, but actually most of the city was still in ruins. They hadn't as yet rebuilt many of the houses since the time when the Babylonians had come in and basically ransacked the the, the city. So when the people came back from exile, remember they were coming back to rebuild Jerusalem to restore the proper worship. And we know that they had stops and starts during that time. But they came from uh, these, they they started to rebuild um, the, the walls and rebuild the city. But they hadn't settled in the city. We know uh, in the chapters we looked at previously, there were people coming from all these different regions to help the rebuilding work. And during the time of the most difficult opposition, remember, Nehemiah said to them, well, basically, don't go home to your area just yet. You know, stay here and rebuild the walls for your own safety. Otherwise, the enemy's going to attack you. So people were coming from the regions. These were other believers who were coming in to help with the rebuilding work. But it was a different matter entirely to settle there permanently. Few had taken that step. And when you think about it, let's, let's think about it from their perspective. It would be easy for us to turn around and condemn them and say, ha, look at what they've done. You know, they didn't, oh, they weren't willing to commit there. But consider what they'd done over time. When they came back from exile, they'd made their homes in these outlying rural areas. If you like, they'd gotten to know the neighbours. They'd gotten to know the neighbourhood. And many of them had adapted to this new rural life as well. And what was being asked of them was to to come to a place then which was barren and empty. That's what Jerusalem was like. Yes, the temple had been rebuilt. The walls were looking well. They'd all been built. The city was now secure. But it wasn't populated. You know, it's not easy for them to uproot all of their families and come to a place that was barren and empty. You know, for 142 years, Jerusalem had had been left without a wall. 142 years. It had left Jerusalem vulnerable to attack over those years. And in many ways, many parts of it had been left derelict. Now, if you've ever seen any derelict buildings, you can maybe get a bit of an insight of, of what this might have been like. These buildings, many of them have been torn down. Many of the homes have been destroyed. And I'm sure in the city there was maybe uh, bits of uh, grass or weeds were growing up even around the city as well. So it wasn't exactly a glamorous location. You know what to do whenever they're building uh, new homes. You know, we we see new homes going up around Cumber all the time. And what they do is they have these wonderful posters, don't they? And they paint this picture of this idyllic scene, don't they? Beautiful houses and, you know... Uh, and you see people usually there's someone going out for a wee stroll usually with their dog or something on these things when you see them all up you know what they're like but yet here Jerusalem wasn't exactly a glamorous location Nehemiah couldn't exactly put together the brochure and say come to Jerusalem and here's someone enjoying the lovely building in Jerusalem because many of the buildings were still torn down but yet God used people like Zerubbabel and also a further return of the people led by Ezra. And he'd used these people to restore the temple. And worship had been restored. And people were coming into Jerusalem for these outlying areas to worship there. But yet what a sad reflection of Jerusalem this was. And we're reminded though um, it was the holy city in verse 1. Notice how the writer subtly reminds us of that. He also emphasizes it again later. I think it's verse um, is it verse eight? or maybe one of the other versions, verses later he talks about the city of God the holy city yes verse 18 again this is a holy city this was God's city this was a city who uh, God would make his dwelling place there among his people this was where they were to worship this was the center of their worship and yet what a sad reflection in many ways of what it should have been you know the city had been torn down it was because initially of course of their sin how they'd sinned against God and he'd given them into the hands of their enemies. 
But while this city was being rebuilt, it was going to require a great commitment of them to actually be willing to, you know, it's okay, it's easy to say, we'll obey God. And that's what they'd done in this covenant commitment ceremony. They, they said they were going to obey God. But it's another thing entirely to actually step out and to do what God had said. And it was God's will that they would come back to this city and rebuild it. Look at verse 1. By this stage, it was only really the leaders of the people who were living in Jerusalem. You know, maybe we've seen how the leaders were leading the way before in the previous chapter about even the repentance. They led the way. They led the way also even in signing this document as well. So they were leading by example. Maybe Nehemiah had to prompt some of them, I don't know. Or maybe it was just the result of that conviction of the word. But yet the rest of the people still remained outside of the city. So this plan was formed that they would cast lots in order that a tenth of the people would come to Jerusalem. And notice this subtle reminder then that the writer gives us here. The holy city again, verse 1, referring to the city of God. The place where God was going to, it said, where God would make his name dwell there. The place where the temple was, the center of their worship. So imagine how it would be if they spent all that time rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the walls, and yet still continue to live away from Jerusalem. It would be a bit strange. Think of the witness that would have actually to other people. You know, as they looked at others who weren't believers, as they looked upon the city of Jerusalem, thought, well, there's a nice looking city, but have you heard about the state of the rest of it? Think of how that would even reflect on them. It would reflect on their witness. That was not God's will. God's will was that they would repopulate that city again. And we might wonder, why, why cast lots? This was something we find a few occasions in the Old Testament. Uh, For example, whenever they go into the promised land, they actually uh, cast lots even to say who's going to go where as well too. That's how they sought God's will in that that culture in that day. But we find casting lots rarely in the New Testament. Uh, The the, the occasion where we find it is where they're trying to appoint um, a replacement for Judas, uh, where they have a number of contenders basically who could uh, fulfill that. But, you know, of course, we don't need to cast lots today to discern God's will. Because God has revealed his will and his word. And we have the Holy Spirit who uses that word to guide and direct us. The Spirit also guides through even convicting us as well too. The God also also guides us even through directing circumstances in our life today. So we don't need to cast lots. We have God's revealed word, don't we? But yet, when they were casting these lots, it wasn't just a case of, don't think this was the equivalent of them, you know, just drawing a name out of a hat. That was not how they viewed it. Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. So they were recognizing that God was in control. And as one commentator points out, by casting the lot, it's no longer Nehemiah who's forcing them to live in Jerusalem, but it's the will of God. So the people were willing to say, okay, the lot's going to be cast. And if this comes forward, then then we'll go to live in Jerusalem. And you know, think about what was being asked of them. To those who were settled, some of them quite far even away from Jerusalem. Some of these people now. As I say, it was very different than city life. Rural life and city life is very, very different. And, you know, as Emma will tell you, having moved from, from Lisbon to Belfast coming from a place where, you know, just a few minutes up the road is a farm with llamas and cows. Instead, now Emma's uh, sitting looking out onto a carriageway. So it's very different there already, you know. Um, There's certain benefits, obviously, being closer to shops. But anyway, city life's very different, isn't it? Rural life's very different as well. So a lot were being asked of these people to up where they were living to come. Before, they'd have been maybe growing crops, Many of them had vegetables, different crops, and curing. they were caring for cattle as well. So to uproot everything was actually a big thing that was being asked of them. And I think there's a tendency, we can sort of look at this and say, it's not terrible, they weren't. But consider what was the sacrifice was being asked of these people. They were going to leave behind their neighbors, their family members, some of them, because maybe not all of the family members were, were maybe going to come. Some of them maybe thought, you know what? I'd rather stay in the country. You know, in verse 2, we read that the people blessed 
all those who, who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. Again, there's some debate here. Some say maybe this is referring to um, the, the group that, that responded. Maybe some of them weren't willing whenever the lot came forward. Others see verse 2 as maybe referring to a second group, a group of volunteers who said, look, we'll come along as well and we'll help. Either way, the point is that God wants willing workers, not begrudging volunteers. People who are doing it because they want to and for the right reasons. Not for recognition before others or for status or power, but people who are giving themselves wholly and completely to God. And you know today there are many churches up and down our land who face in many ways a similar situation to what the church of the people of Jerusalem faced. You know, some have moved away from places where they are needed and instead go to other places. And I know there are various reasons even why people uh, leave churches, but there are also some who view church as a, as a consumer attitude. And, and Gordon was speaking about this during the week. You know, some people maybe choose churches based on worship style or on programs that they run, or maybe even the kinds of people that attend the church. Maybe going to a church where they feel Uh, where there are many people maybe even the same age as them or the same background. But in doing so, the the church that they leave behind suffers even for their absence. As as, 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 as the Lord even says, even in in his word, the church wasn't meant to to be like this, as Gordon also said as well too. In fact, the early church was meant to be made up of, of people from all different backgrounds. There was Jew, there was Gentile, there was slave and free. There was rich and poor. The early church was a, was a mixture of all people of different ages, different cultures, different backgrounds. And the powerful thing that united them wasn't their culture. It wasn't just because they were a part of that church. No, the, the thing that united them was that their faith in Christ. And that had a powerful effect. It was a powerful witness. Because to the, the, the outside world looking on, they thought, you know, these people shouldn't really be getting on with one another because they were so vastly different in the early church. But yet they were. They were a new people. Their identity, first and foremost now, was, was Christians. And so here, this is the way that the church is, is meant to be. We're meant to be people, not just all people who are the, the same as, uh, as, uh, as uh, we don't just meet with the people who are the same as us. We meet with others as well too. People from different backgrounds, different ages. That's good and that's healthy. And you know, over the years in Jerusalem, you know, though the exiles had returned with the intention of rebuilding the, the temple in the city, many hadn't commit, fully committed themselves to dwelling in the city. Even the priests and Levites, as we see, they were living even in the outlying areas. And you know, there are many churches up and down our land who, who need people, people willing to commit to their local church. It's so important that People plug into a, a local church. It's important that they support that local church. And, do you know, the local church needs, needs you. It needs all of us. There's a great need in many churches up and down our land. And, you know, some are driving miles to go to other places when there's a, a great need even here. There is a great need. But the only way that that change can happen in those people's hearts is is that if God puts it into their hearts to get involved, to see that need, to meet that need. And that's the way that this was only going to happen here amongst these people. They were never just going to automatically come and just uproot things and and come settle in Jerusalem. They weren't going to come because Nehemiah put together a fancy brochure or tried to persuade them with his words. They were only going to come if God put it in their heart. Maybe there were some who, when the lot came up, thought, no. But there was others who did respond and responded willingly, and they were blessed for it. This is the great need. But what about the people involved? The second thing, the people involved in their priority. And the rest of chapter 11, we find a list of those who did indeed answer the call. And in chapter 3 onwards, we find the list of those who responded. Now, we see in verse 3, uh, sorry, verse 3 onwards, we meet different kinds of people. Priests, Levites, temple servants, descendants of Solomon's servants. 
And notice it began with two, uh, the families of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And in these verses, we see two, ver- two families of Judah are mentioned and three families of Benjamin. Now, when you talk about families, don't have in your mind um, you know, someone with 2.4 children or whatever the, the stats are nowadays. You know, two, two children coming along. A family was, it's talking about their, even their, their clan as well. A clan of people even moving here. Um, so there's two families of Judah, three families of Benjamin. And Jerusalem, you see, was the area that was, that was really their territory. And you'll notice there's another little phrase that occurs a few times here. Verse 6, we meet the sons of Perez. And they came from Judah. Uh, but we're told that they were valiant men. Now again, we see this brought up in verses 7 to 8. They're sons of Benjamin. And they also were men of valor. You see, it was going to take great courage to make this step. This wasn't easy. This wasn't easy. And you know, it's not easy if even, even uh, maybe someone who maybe is going to another church does see a need in a local church. It's not easy for them to uproot their family and just, and just come. It wasn't going to be easy for them to actually uproot from their neighboring villages and come to Jerusalem. Because they weren't coming to a place that was actually all up and running. They were coming to a place where in Jerusalem there was, there was ruins they were coming to. They weren't coming to a lovely you know, a place with a, a pool or a, a lovely back garden or you know, a lovely roofside terrace. No, the roof was probably laying in rubbles in the ground actually when they came. They were coming. They were going to have to near start from scratch. So it wasn't going to be easy. They were going to need courage. They were also going to face opposition. And, you know, when we're trying to do the Lord's work, we will face opposition. You know, you easily know this if you, if you try and share your faith. Because while some may welcome, while some may listen to what you have to say, not everyone's going to welcome that. You will face opposition. They were going to need courage to press on. Then in verses 10 to 14, we meet a different group, the priests who returned. And remember, these aren't just names of individuals, but these are families. Verse 15 onwards, there are the Levites who assisted the priests. And then in verse 16, there were also some who were over the outside work of the house of the Lord. Now, what kind of outside work is that talking about? It doesn't just mean that they did the garden around the temple. No, but the, the Levites, and, and their, part of their work would be gathering and storing provisions. So they would go get these provisions, bring them to within the temple. They would also care for the temple building itself and property. And as you go on in this passage, what you see is there's different kinds of people mentioned and different kinds of roles. For example, verse 17, there's a man called Madaniah, and he was the leader of the priests. He led the people in their worship. There were 284 Levites in total. There was other characters as well. There was verse 19, there was gatekeepers, temple security. See, there were great treasures within the temple. They needed gatekeepers as well. There was also certain parts of the temple where people were not allowed to enter. So it was important that they had these gatekeepers. There was also, in verse 22, a man named Uzi, who was part of the singers over the, the house uh, of God as well. So can you see, there's, there's a lot of different people involved. In verses 22 to 24 as well, uh, 23 to 24, we're also reminded that the king had made a provision. So don't think that because these people were in Jerusalem that they'd had separation from uh, the rulers of of Persia. No, not at all. He was still providing for the work and he appointed a liaison as well. There was a man in verse 24 who was responsible to reporting for what's going on in Jerusalem. So even though they're living here, they're still under Persian control ultimately as well. But yet the Lord had gained them favor to to allow them to make provision for this work. But the whole picture here is different people are involved. Priests, Levites, temple servants, there's gatekeepers, there's singers. Can you see there's a lot going on behind the scenes? There was a lot going on. There was a lot of people in order that the temple, that that the worship would function correctly. But you know, the same is true in church life. There's a part for everyone to play. You know, we were asking for some ideas even about events we could run to engage with our community. And, and a few had suggested some great ideas as well. But we also need people to actually get these ideas up and running as well too. People who say, you know, I can help with that. 
Just like we had with our, our Easter club that ran, you know, there was many different helpers involved in that. I'm thankful for every one of those helpers who played their part. You know, at the time I was sitting at home and, and, and I isolation a bit frustrated when everyone was out going out hand night leaflets around the doors. But there was people who were hand night leaflets. There was others who were um, setting up the hall. There was others who were assisting, preparing the, the, the crafts. Um, oh, I remember Yvonne trying to, to apparently you were, you were blunting, I don't know how many of those wooden sticks as well too. But th- that, was, that was something that needed done for those crafts. People who were stepping up to, to even say, well, I'd come along and sit with the children. Or I'd sit at the door and I'd keep a record of all those coming in. And, and there was others who were teaching as well too. The point is that each group was needful. Each person was needful. And when someone wasn't there, we, we would have missed them. Each was needful and important. And each of these groups was needful in running the temple. And we see, don't just, not just the people here, but their priority. See, it wasn't just a case of a random group of people returned. It wasn't just a case of uh, Nehemiah saying, come to us, we'll take anyone. No, and those who were brought forward and those who came to serve, they were willing to serve in a particular capacity. But notice, we're told, there's a reason why we're told about priests, Levites, temple servants. There's where the focus was, worship. Priority was worship of God. Their priority was the relationship with God. See, it wasn't enough that they had made that covenant with God. They needed to continue to walk with God. So what is when we, as believers, when we come to Christ, it's not just about making, uh, having, getting, a, getting a ticket to heaven and then going out and, and living life now how we want. We must live our life according to God's word. We must continue to walk with the Lord each day and depend on him too. And you see, that's what this worshipping community was about. They wanted to see people walking with the Lord. For many years they'd, they'd grown cold. Their hearts weren't what they should be. But yet, they wanted this restored. And an important part of this was these people coming in. These people serving where they should be and giving glory to God. Now, of course, today, there isn't one temple, one central place to worship. No, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Our bodies are likened to temples, and and we um, don't have priests. We believe in the priesthood of all believers, meaning that um, because of our position in Christ, we can approach God. We can talk to him in prayer, and we can come before him. And and we don't have, the the roles we have today are different. We have elders and deacons as, as God's word is appointed. We don't fulfill those roles by casting lots. No, these roles are chosen by the criteria God has given in his word. People of good reputation, people of good character, and people of good spirituality as well too. See, worship matters, and it should be a priority for us all. But it's important that we come to God in the way he's decreed. You know, we come here not just to go through the motions. We come here not because it's something that we've always done. We come here because we should want to give glory to God. We come in spirit and truth. That's the kind of worship that God delights in. Not begrudging worship. Not worship where we're singing the hymns without really thinking about what we're doing. We are to be fully here and engaged in worship. I read an illustration in one book one time where um, the writer talked about how he remembers being in primary school and he had a teacher who called the names in the class row and the teacher always said, you know, whenever I read your name out, you're the answer here. But one student in the class delighted in being different. There's always one, isn't there? You know, and whenever his name was called out, he didn't say here. Here's what he said, present. And the teacher always used to scowl at him and the rest would, you know, snigger a bit. See, the thing is, he was present, but he wasn't actually there. Maybe that was his moment of rebellion. You know, saying, I'm here in body, but not in spirit. You know, and he says this. He says, I want to thank my classmate, not for his behavior, but for giving him an important word. Actually, present. You know, when we come to the church, are we truly present? Are we just here in body? Or are we here in spirit as well? Are we mindful of the words that we sing in our hymns? 
do we think about really what we're saying in those hymns? Or what about when, when we pray? When I pray, are you, are you praying along with me? Or in the Bible reading? Or even in the, in the sermon? You know, I knew someone once who, uh, when you were talking to them, and it was sometimes like you were talking to them, but they were far away. I used to liken to it. It was like their, their brain went into screensaver mode. You know how it is in the computer? If you leave your computer and all of a sudden all these pictures come up. And sometimes that's, that's sometimes what it can be. Maybe, maybe sometimes we're, we're sitting here and we're thinking about, I wonder did I remember to put the oven on or the slow cooker on? Or what are we going to do later on? Or where are we going to go tomorrow? You know, it's a challenge to all of us. You know, maybe it's maybe you've, you've been tired after maybe not sleeping well last night as well too. And it's hard. It requires focus as well. But you know, in God's word, we're to be engaged with that word. We're to be impacted by that word. You see, the church is God's idea. It's not man's. As Gordon was impressing upon us, he's appointed even order in the church as well. Do you know, and what we see here is, here was a group of people being brought together to serve God. And verses 25 to 36 go on to tell us even the villages where people were coming from. And you know what? When you add up the numbers, and I didn't do the math for this, I have to confess, I read it, okay? But when you add up the list, you get 3,044 people. That's those who were coming to settle in Jerusalem. Now, Nehemiah records those who returned from captivity were see that there were actually 30,447. But don't forget there's another return as well of people. There was more people who returned in Ezra's time too. You know, when Ezra came back, he also brought some with him. So that list of people, that's, not just in, that's only mentioning the men actually. So there's actually more people here, maybe around 10,000 if you include their families, if you include their, you know, their wives and their children as well too. But when you consider those who didn't come, that means the list is actually even greater, way more even than 100,000 who didn't come to settle in Jerusalem. Do you know there is a challenge here, isn't there? Because there was only a few people who came and settled. But you know, I'm reminded of a, a hymn that was sung long ago. I think it's a Southern Gospel hymn, actually. And it used to say this, Little is much when God is in it. Don't underestimate what God can do with a small group of people. Isn't that how many of the revival started? With just, in the Isle of Lewis, wasn't it, two women who were blind and were, were praying at home for revival to come to that island. And God brought it. God can do so much with the people who are willing, with the people who are praying. But when we see lists of this, as we close, it reminds us God uses individuals even to play a part. And each one needs to do the work, but God's purpose will prevail. See, it was God's will that Jerusalem would be rebuilt. And God was going to do it in his way. Do you know what? They didn't think, I'm sure, that this would ever come about because of a king an ungodly king at that, who would actually permit them to come back. They never dreamt this. But yet God delivered them in such a way. They couldn't have dreamed even that a king of Persia would provide for them to actually continue their worship. Yet this is what happened. You know, when we pray, we're to have faith. Have faith. Believe that God can do it. If God wills it, he can do it. Do you know there was a need? There was a priority, priority of worship. And you know, we need one another, don't we? As I finish, today is the day of the marathon. I never ran the food thing. I, uh, I, I ate plenty of marathons in my time. I think they're called Snickers now. But um, I did run the relay, ran the relay two, on two occasions. And the thing I always remember about it, as you were running, you know, I wasn't always necessarily the fittest, but when I ran it, it was the encouragement that you got on the way. People who were often in the sidelines, encouraging you on. Do you know what? You need that in the Christian life. The Christian life was never meant to be a solo activity. It was never meant to be like that. 
God gave the church so we could serve together. God gave the church so we could encourage one another, so we could pray for one another, and so we could help one another along the way. Always remember, we're not in this race on our own. So let us run it together. Let us run it well. And let us look to Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, that you brought these people together. Lord, that your purpose was accomplished. And Father, we know that these people weren't perfect. The people of Jerusalem, Lord, were, were just human. Father, they sought to serve you. They sought to honor you. And Father, we seek to honor you and glorify you. Lord, we too, you're not perfect. But Father, just help us as we seek to give of our lives to you. Help us to commit ourselves to you. And Father, we do pray even for, for maybe other families, Lord, even as they move into this area, that they would see their local church here and that they would support it. We pray even for those maybe even traveling great distances even to go to other churches, that they would see even the need on their doorstep. And Father, there, there are many churches even up and down our association here in this same need. But Lord, we pray that if you will it, Lord, that you can do it. Your will will be accomplished as it was accomplished in Jerusalem. So Lord, be accomplished in us. Help us to play our part. Help us to be faithful in prayer, to be persistent in prayer, to be believing in prayer. And Lord, help us to glorify you. Lord, we do commit this time, this word into your hands. And bless us now as we come around the table. Help us even as we sing this hymn to consider the great truths that it presents to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn as we go to communion is Who is on the Lord's Side? And its third verse reminds us, Jesus, thou hast bought us not with gold or gem, but with thine own lifeblood for thy diadem. With thy blessing filling, each who comes to thee, thou hast made us willing, thou hast made us free. And by thy grand redemption, by thy grace divine, we are on the Lord's side, Saviour, we are thine. Let's stand just to change our positions as we sing this together, please.
Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, and I want to read from verse 22. Verse 22 down to verse 24 of Hebrews 12. And God's word says, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And we'll end our reading there at verse 24. So in the Old Testament, Jerusalem was a very important place indeed. As I've already said today, it was the, the holy city. Mount Zion, that was the goal of the, where, where Lord, the Lord's people when they left Egypt. But in the New Testament, we see God's people are citizens also of a, a, a greater kingdom. We see the passage here speaks of a heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. Rather than some earthly destination, it is talking about a heavenly Jerusalem. It reminds us that in Christ we have access not only to this heavenly kingdom, but to God himself when we come to him through Christ. Of course, we know one day there will be a new Jerusalem, even here on this earth, a new creation. But we read today in this passage of those who who dwell, uh, we read today in Nehemiah, of those who dwelt in Jerusalem, their priority was worship. But Hebrews reveals even that this also, this worship will be a priority in heaven. Because as the angels, it says, gather, they too will worship. But we know so will believers from all different places, all different countries, will gather singing God's praises. People from different places, people from different backgrounds. It's hard for us to imagine what that's like. I often used to love the assembly meetings even for that because people were gathering from lots of different churches, from lots of different places even as well, some from the north of Ireland, some from the south, but they were gathering together to unite our hearts in praise to God. And it was always tremendous to hear that sound. But can we, you imagine what it's going to be like one day when we'll all be praising the Lord? Those who will be a part of that number, our names will be recorded too. Our names are recorded as citizens of that heavenly kingdom. We have our names in that Lamb's Book of Life. You know, and nowadays when, when we go somewhere, when we travel, you know, we need to ensure that we have all the, the necessary paperwork that we need, don't we? We have our ticket, we have our, our passport, we check the rules, maybe even regarding the pandemic as well. But in verse 24 of this passage, we are reminded the means by which we enter this heavenly kingdom. It's through Jesus, the mediator of that new covenant, and through his blood. You know, it talks about the blood of Abel. Uh, The blood of Abel cried out, you see, for vengeance. But Christ's blood, it says, speaks a better word. And what is that better word? Well, it's a better word because Christ's blood cries out for forgiveness. Forgiveness for God's children and atonement. Do you know, in our worship around this table, we give thanks for that shed blood and for the fact that Christ offered his body as a sacrifice for our sin. But I wonder to, how, how often do we think about this kingdom, this heavenly Jerusalem, also even of this new creation that one day there'll be, of this new Jerusalem. When one day this broken world with its sin, with its corruption and, immortal, and, and immorality sorry, around us, when one day we'll be made new, do we ever think about our destination where we're going to spend eternity? Do you know, when you, you think about it, when you're going on your holidays somewhere, you often research about the place you're going to go. You maybe ask people for, for advice. You try and find out all the information you can. You get the brochures. You maybe look up things online. But here's somewhere we're going to spend eternity. How often do we spend time thinking of that? to think of what that will be like, to spend time looking even in God's word as to what it says about that. Do you know, when we come to Christ, we have access to him now. We have access to him in that heavenly place. We can come because of our position in Christ. 
We come not through our merits, but through faith in Christ and what he has done for us. He is the one who this passage says is our mediator. His blood was shed for our sins. And so we give him thanks. So let us pray together now and give him thanks. Let me read the passage just before our brothers here give thanks. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he is betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord Jesus, as we gather here on our last Sunday, we give you thanks that we were able to gather here together in our Jesus. We have a time to come to remember what you've done for us. So Lord Jesus, we should thank that for God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten Son, that we shall have to believe unto him, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Mm-hmm. Lord Jesus, just to thank that you came to this world, this sinful world, where you gave your life in a remission for our sins. You hung upon that cruel on the cross, mm-hmm. where your body was broken, mm-hmm. your blood was spilt, Lord, just to pray and save each one of us, Lord. Jesus, so as we take this bread, mm-hmm. this bread that's open up your broken body, we give you thanks that you turned enough to come yes. to save a sinner like me. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to meet again around your table. Thank you, Lord, for our Savior, for the reminder, Lord, that that he is our mediator, and that, Lord, he shed his blood that we might be redeemed, that once and for all sacrifice. Oh, Lord, previous to that, Lord, the blood of bulls had been shed many times, but when our Savior gave his blood, it was once and forever. Father, thank you for the cleansing power of our Savior's blood. And just now, Lord, as we would take up this cup, which reminds us of that precious shed blood, accept our thanks again for what he has done for us. In Jesus' name.
Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, that because of our faith in Christ Jesus, we are citizens of a, a heavenly kingdom. And Father, we know that we are kept even by your power, Lord, even until that day. We want to give you thanks, not just for your saving power, but for your keeping power in our lives. And so, Lord, help us as we seek to live as citizens of this heavenly kingdom, as we seek to represent our Savior, as we seek to be good ambassadors. Father, help us to do that. But Father, we give you thanks for the help that you supply us, that you've given us the the message of your word, that you've given us your spirit, Lord, to even just give us the, the boldness even to witness, to even guide us in our lives to even give us understanding when we read your word. We want to thank you, Lord, for the spirit which indwells us. And so, Lord, we ask as we even leave here and as we gather again again tonight around your word, Lord, be glorified in our lives. Use us in your service and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.